I'm uh, Lieutenant Navy Jason Delaney. I work for the Directorate of History and Heritage, which is a branch of the Department of National Defense, and I work as a naval historian, uh, primarily on Cold War uh, naval history uh, and after the Second World War in particular, in the early days of the Cold War. We had a particular problem in the late 1950s and the early 1960s. It was commonly referred to as the anti-submarine crisis or the submarine, nuclear submarine crisis. So what ended up happening is about 1957, the Americans launched their first nuclear submarine called USS Nautilus. Uh, in essence, when the Nautilus uh, was launched and she began her trials and to really prove what she could do, breaking underwater records, uh, and participating in anti-submarine warfare exercises, um, what the senior leaders within the Navy realized is that there really aren't a whole lot of options for anti-submarine warfare at that time because of her, because of Nautilus's capabilities. The idea behind uh, using a hydrofoil was that the anti-submarine problem was that you couldn't catch Nautilus. She was faster than our, our uh, sonar systems could track. She was faster than our torpedoes could track down. Uh, and uh, certainly we needed something to be able to range out fast if we had detection and be able to make contact with, uh, with the fast deep diving nuclear submarine. Uh, and one of these options was a hydrofoil. It was only one of many options that we were looking into at the time. One, another one is the anti-submarine um, rocket propelled torpedo called ASROC. So essentially what we were trying to do was attach a rocket to our torpedo and throw it really, really far. Uh, if we had uh, a good range on, on a submarine. Um, the other options that we were trying that we did use to success was uh, adapting the helicopter to destroyers and being able to use the, uh, the large anti-submarine warfare helicopter to be able to range out, make second contact with, with the submarine and be able to attack it with its own torpedo. So these are the problems that existed in the 1960s, uh, early 1960s, in terms of how we were trying to deal with the nuclear submarine threat. The hydrofoil was a good example of, of the capability we needed in the sense that it was fast. So if we did have a good long range detection, uh, we, should, we would be able to range out there really fast and be able to prosecute that, that contact early, uh, make that second detection and be able to attack it. Uh, most of the time, by the time um, uh, a submarine got with inside detection range, the, the surface vessel that was prosecuting it was already in danger of being attacked by the submarine itself. It was already inside its attack bubble. So this is, this is a problem for surface forces. Uh, the best platform to be able to, to, to deal with a nuclear submarine was another nuclear submarine because they're both in the same environment. They're both in the same uh, fighting space, if you will. Uh, for a submarine, to find another submarine, it's a lot easier when you're in that actual environment as opposed to uh, above the surface or even on the surface of the water, you're at a disadvantage. So we were contemplating things uh, and using things and developing things such as the variable depth sonar. So if we couldn't track a submarine with the sonar that was hull mounted on the ship, uh, we, had to, we had to get the sonar below the different temperature gradients, if you will, to be able to make those detections. At the time, our destroyers could achieve probably about 25 knots realistically, uh, whereas submarines can go 30 plus at the time, nuclear submarines. Uh, so we had a problem. You know, and, and the air, this was a surface problem. The aircraft carriers that the Americans were employing at the time also were able to achieve great speeds because they had a lot of power behind them. And it's also about how much power you can put into a vessel and how fast it can go. But you had to cope with that drag. Uh, that drag effect of the, of the water against the hull. Um, so what a hydrofoil does is it solves that problem by essentially developing wings below the surface uh, on the bottom of the hull and they react with the water at a very minimal level because there's a minimal amount of surface space but if you think of it as an airplane and how an airplane achieves lift 
the hydrofoil is doing the same thing for the, for the vessel and it's getting the hull out of the water. And once the hull is out of the water and you have minimal surface area actually contacting the water, you can achieve greater speeds. Hence why Bredore could achieve 63 knots, which was double a nuclear submarine at the time. With mutual assured destruction, in other words, guaranteed through nuclear missiles, uh, defense departments in, in the West decided, and this is spearheaded by McNamara and the Kennedy administration, that we needed another way to fight a war in these little wars, and it was called flexible response. So the response to any kind of agitation from the Soviet Union or any of the Warsaw Pact can't always be nuclear weapons, because if it did, we're talking about the destruction of the planet. So there had to be some, some way of waging war and fighting these smaller conflicts at a level where you're not going to nuclear weapons, and that was flexible response. So with inside that flexible response um, uh, type of doctrine, we had to come up with other ways of, of doing business, and we wanted to be able to fight in peacekeeping missions or be able to uh, at least put forces on peacekeeping missions and keep these smaller conflicts that are happening around the world uh, as small as they can so they do not blow up into large confrontations at, at the superpower level. Uh, so this was all going on in the background in the 1960s as the hydrofoil uh, is being, is being um, looked into. Now what it causes is a separation between what the Department of National Defense wanted and what the, what the government wanted. The government wanted the military to, to, to do, have these peacekeeping roles uh, and so forth. But when it comes to the Navy, the Navy does not have a large peacekeeping footprint other than transportation, transporting troops from one place to another. There's no function for a Navy in a peacekeeping role, especially when it's on land and in, some, in a third world country or anything like that. So the Navy's problem continued to be the defense of North America from nuclear carrying submarines. Uh, and that's where the hydrofoil came into it. So as, as much as the Department of National Defense was being torn apart and budgets were shrinking and uh, programs were being canceled such, such as the General Purpose Frigate, um, Hellyer actually clung to the hydrofoil and he supported it. And, and in an era where they were cutting these budgets and they were rationalizing, he authorized the expenditure for these, this experimental uh, platform to be, to be investigated. So it was very strange. Very strange. As for a research and development project during uh, budget cuts, why is he hanging on to this one in particular? And the reason for that is because it was part of uh, a tri-national or tripartite um, uh, investigation into hydrofoils between Canada's two largest defense partners, which is the United Kingdom and the United States. So the idea was that instead of each nation investigating things on their own, they would um, combine forces and not overlap work. So when it came to the hydrofoil, uh, the United States said they would investigate a certain type of hydrofoil, which was the submerged hydrofoil. Uh, the United Kingdom uh, said that they would investigate hovercrafts for, for this type of work. And Canada settled on the surface piercing uh, form of, um, of, of hydrofoil. Uh, but the, the goal was the same, to develop this type of technology. Now. In Canada, it was wrapped around our main function as a Navy, which is anti-submarine warfare. So the Labrador was always going to be an ASW platform, uh, and we were going to develop it first as, as a platform, see how fast it can go, if we can actually build this thing, and if it works. And once it did, then we would worry about putting the fighting systems on board. But Hallier didn't really um, focus on the anti-submarine warfare component of Bredore. All he wanted was the fact that Canada had committed itself uh, in this trilateral agreement to research one certain aspect of the hydrofoil. So he was willing to put money into it. Simply, and, and in his own words, in his biography, he called it, it was research for research's sake. Uh, so he thought about the project a lot differently and the government thought about the project a lot differently from the, the Navy which really still had this anti-submarine, this nuclear submarine problem that they're trying to solve. So Bredore ca was caught up in the middle of this. Um, unfortunately, Bredore, uh, her concept was successful. She was fast, she broke speed record. Her, her type of foil in particular 
was the faster foil because the higher out of the water you are, the less surface area is in there, the faster you go. So Bedore accomplished that, in, in my opinion. Like she achieved a, um, a speed of 63 knots, which is about 117 kilometers an hour on the water. So I'm pretty sure it was a world record at the time. Whether or not it's been superseded is prob probably has. But at the time, she did her job. She, she proved it was feasible to be able to have a foil in the open ocean and do this. Unfortunately, there were some problems. And the materials that were being used, uh, there was cracking in the foils uh, and so forth. And the project eventually uh, escalated to the point where the research had been proven. Uh, and as far as uh, you know, the government was concerned, as far as the senior leadership of the Navy was concerned, um, it had done its job and they didn't progress into the fighting equipment fitting stage. So in at about 1977, 68, around there, it was decided to lay the ship up for about five years and then eventually it was decommissioned. They really focused on the warfighting component and what these hydrofoils could do. So as much as we were developing Bredore for any submarine warfare, the Americans were developing their hydrofoils for, for shore bombardment uh, and other things to be able to use them as gunboats. And in fact, two of the prototypes were fitted with main guns. Uh, and one had a 152 millimeter gun, which is a very large gun to have on a small platform like, like a hydrofoil, and had torpedo tubes. So the thing was really a super fast gunboat. And two of them deployed to, to the Vietnam War and were stationed in Cameron Bay. Um, they were fast, they could shoot their guns at speed, and their shore bombardment uh, capability was absolutely fantastic. So being able to go fast and shoot targets ashore was, was, a, an, a, it was a capability. And that's what the Americans were trying to develop, was a capability. What could these things do? Unfortunately, those two that were sent off to the Vietnam War had to come back because they proved too mechanically complicated to sustain uh, overseas in theater. Um, then the other, one of the other uh, uh, hydrofoils that they developed was they wanted to build a large one, so they actually built the USS Plainview. And the USS Plainview was uh, about 200 tons, so about 50 tons larger than Bredore. And uh, it was being developed for its ocean-going capabilities uh, and testing that concept. But again, you know, there's very different roles that the, the Americans were searching to use these, these hydrofoils for, and their program eventually led into the 1980s into the, into the Pegasus class, and six of them were built and they were used as fast uh, patrol gunboats as well. Um, but again, the Americans didn't have the problem that we had because they had a very large anti-submarine, uh, nuclear submarine program, right? So that, they were actually prosecuting their anti-submarine threat by using nuclear submarines, and they were pretty much the larger submarine force at the time. Um, so they didn't need to use a hydrofoil as an anti-submarine weapon. Uh, they were fighting the, the submerged battle one-on-one -on -one with nuclear submarines, and that's the way that you needed to prosecute that. Only another submarine could hunt another submarine. If you don't understand the complexity of the naval problem at the time, and then understand the politics inside Canada at the time, the project doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And certainly there was a lot of negative publicity that was, uh, that was written in, in the mail, and the news, sorry, uh, at the time that it was a, that it was a huge uh, expense for absolutely no reason. Uh, the cost escalated from a, a projected 26 million to, to I think the final total was about 52 million by the time they decided to lay it up and, uh, and, and put it into mothballs. But uh, there was a lot of criticism for that much money being spent for no actual result. And I would actually argue that that's the wrong way of looking at the project. The project uh, achieved other goals that were, that were non-tangible in terms of our commitments to, uh, to our allies and in terms of um, uh, being able just to develop you know, that capability and see where it went. And it was something that it was being supported at the political level. And unfortunately, for, for a nation that uh, doesn't have a whole lot of, uh, of, of, of resources going into its defense budget, such as the United States, then we have to pick our battles. And, and this was one of them. This was one of the ones where we actually had a chance to do something great, but you know, not, a, not a lot came from it. Uh, except for the fact that some of the technologies and some of the innovations that went into Labrador, so these are the, some of those untangible things, is that 
uh, they, they filtered out into other projects the Navy were working on at the time, like the four future uh, helicopter destroyers. So a lot of the innovations, a lot of the stuff about welding, uh, a lot of the stuff about combat systems, because Labrador was going to be using the first digital combat system and command and control system in our Navy and it eventually went into the next class of destroyer. So there's a lot of things that were being developed. It's not just about the hydrofoil. There was a lot of things that were being developed at the time, a lot of experience being gained by the members that were that were working on these projects. And that was carrying forward into other projects the Navy were working on at the time. So if you look from the outside and you see the, the Bredor project as a, as a research project that eventually failed and was useless, um, that's a very superficial way of looking at it. And you gotta dig deep and find all the reasons and rationale for why it was why it was proposed in the first place and 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 the innovation that we do I mean if you look at what we did it was an amazing accomplishment to be able to to produce an aluminum ship essentially an aircraft for the water and be able to break put the thing and build it and put it in the water and break records and uh, improve the concept it was an amazing accomplishment for the Royal Canadian Navy and the defense research establishment in Canada so there was definitely a lot of gains and a lot of a lot of pride that could be uh, brought out of that project in particular, even though there wasn't a successful class of the Bredor afterward. Um, and essentially that's the sad part about the story, but it was there's, there was other like, projects at the same time that the Air Force were going through that met similar fate, such as the Avro Arrow. Uh, and then, you know, this is, the, this is what was going on at the time, and this is the, uh, the stuff that we had to deal with in the 1960s and late 1950s in particular.